Good morning, everyone. My name is Dick Tauber, and I am the Vice President of Transmission Systems and New Technology for the CNN News Group. I would like to welcome you to the Content Distribution Forum. Uh, this event is produced every year uh, by the Society of Satellite Professionals International and the World Teleports Association, and, and that's done in cooperation with the NAB. And it's, a, it's really the only live, on the floor, uh, interactive content uh, session where uh, you get to hear stuff that you may not hear at a booth, uh, in discussion with different people, different vendors, different uh, providers of service. And um, uh, you get to ask questions uh, in, that uh, you may get really answers, good answers to. Um, starting yesterday uh, and then ending tomorrow, these sessions uh, are uh, being presented. There'll be like 12 different panel sessions on the business and technology of content distribution. Uh, from traditional broadcasting to IPTV, from the triple play to mobile video. On Thursday, which is uh, the final day of NAB, they will actually just provide, uh, they'll be providing a playback of the most popular and well-attended sessions, uh, the liveliest sessions that took place in the first three days. Um, I want to mention that this uh, program here at NAB is uh, by SSPI and WTA is made possible by the sponsorship of leading companies in the business, uh, in our business, including Intelsat, operator of the world's largest satellite fleet, Inmarsat, a global leader in mobile satellite services, Embredo uh, Systems, which is offering video uh, processing solutions for HD broadcast cameras and tapeless studios, and Cisco Systems, provider of video, IPTV, cable, and content delivery solutions around the world. Uh, I also want to thank PSSI Global Services. Uh, they are providing the live and recorded video coverage of the forum, uh, which is available from the web uh, websites of both SSPI and WTA. And uh, you can visit uh, the SSPI uh, sorry, the PSSI booth in the central hall at uh, booth number C6448. That's C6448. You can all write that down. Um, finally, if you're interested in learning more about either SSPI or WTA, uh, there's like a rack with some literature uh, at the back here um, at the entrance. Uh, please feel free to help yourself to that information. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Um, first of all, I'm doing this basically in alphabetical order, so there's no favoritism involved. Uh, I'd like to introduce first uh, Peter Elvidge. Uh, Peter joined, Peter, right next to me, joined Globecast in 2001, and, and he has since held a number of positions in its engineering and technology departments most recently as development manager. Based in London, uh, Peter is responsible for uh, realizing the benefits of new technologies, and their uh, commercialization and application to broadcast and media environments. Uh, Peter was previously a marketing specialist with Dolby Laboratories, covering broadcast, consumer, and PC market segments. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of York in, in engineering and business management, as well as being a chartered engineer. Uh, next, uh, we will we'll also hear from Keith Goldberg. Uh, Keith? Keith is executive director of operations for Fox Television. Um, Keith is responsible for overseeing and managing all aspects of transmission requirements for broadcast operations for the Fox Networks Engineering and Operations Group. Networks uh, Engineering and Operations supports a variety of Fox programming, including uh, Network Entertainment, Fox Sports, Fox Sports Net, Fox News, and business channels organizations. Uh, as part of his role, Keith is also responsible for providing coordination to seek uh, opportunities for technology and network planning while finding synergies between News Corp properties, including MySpace, Fox Interactive Media, FIM, 
and the O&O Fox Television Station Group uh, to improve workflow processes and leverage content for new, area, new areas uh, of distribution for both broadcast and online products and channels. I need a raise. <laughs> what, what? He needs a raise. He needs, he needs a raise? I thought you say need is a rest. No. Okay, both. Fact, maybe. If you ask for a raise, you'll get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, then uh, next we're going to hear from uh, Cami Marathaw. Uh, Cami is VP of Marketing for Wegener. Uh, she is Vice President of Marketing, uh, focusing on stra strategic planning and product marketing. Uh, prior to joining Wegener, Cami was, had various engineering and product marketing roles at Motorola previously General Instrument. Uh, Cami is currently president of the Southeast chapter of SSPI and a member of SCTE, uh, WICT, and the WTA. Cami holds an MBA from Emory University, an MSEE from uh, UC San Diego, and a BSEE from uh, Harvey Mudd College. I don't know what any of those initials stand for. Well, I know what some of them stand for. But she'll tell you. Ask her if you don't know. Um, also, uh, today we'll hear from Brian McGurk. Uh, Brian is the SVP from uh, North American Media Services for SES American, uh, Americom New Skies. Or is it New Skies Americom? It's Americom New Skies. Americom New Skies. Okay. Uh, Brian is responsible for sales activities uh, for the North American media business of SS, uh, SES Americom New Skies. Uh, he has over 15 years experience in both traditional cable and television broadcasting as well as interactive television and new technologies both in the U.S. and internationally. Prior to joining SES, uh, Brian served as president of programming and advertising of California-based Open TV where he was at the forefront of many interactive programming developments for advertisers and programmers. Prior to that, uh, Brian was president of, and C COO of TVI Fusion, a digital cable network development and operations company. He is a veteran of NBC Television Network, where he served as VP Affiliate Relations and Entertainment for NBC TV and NBC Asia, and also Turner Broadcasting, where he served as Managing Director in Hong Kong and launched Turner International for CNN, TNT, and Cartoon Network into the Asian markets. Uh, Brian received his uh, BA in Managerial Economics from Union College in New York and has an MBA from Emory University in Atlanta. He is a board member of the Interactive Television Alliance, uh, the SATCOM Advisory Council, as well as a member of the SSPI Advisory Council. Sylvain R Riviera. R well, I'm gonna, uh, you doing well? Okay, good. Um, uh, Sylvain is the EVP of Marketing and Business Development for ATEM, um, a, a, an encoder uh, company, um, because content deploys everywhere. That's a good saying. Uh, Sylvain joined ATEM in 2007 as EVP of Marketing to implement new solutions uh, focused for a ATEM technologies and products in broadcast and broadband market segments. Uh, prior to ATEM, Selvin was uh, Senior Director of Product Marketing for Big Band Networks, uh, a leading provider of broadband multimedia infrastructure for video, voice, and data. Before this, Selvin was a Senior Group Manager at Harmonic, or Divacom, uh, where he led encoding and stream processing product lines. And, um, hang on a sec. I think, uh, and then last but not least is Sean Sullivan. Uh, Sean J.W. Sullivan is the media and, ent uh, uh, media and entertainment uh, for Verizon Business Premier Accounts. Sean joined Verizon in 2005, formerly it was MCI, uh, to start up their media and entertainment initiatives. An industry veteran with over 20 years in the broadcast transmission delivery uh, market, Sean has served in many roles addressing both satellite transmission and fiber optic delivery solutions to the broadcast community. Sean graduated from NYU Film Institute, uh, that's New York University, and attended the American Film Institute in LA. 
Uh, he spent over a decade on the client side of the media business working at Hollywood studios, television production companies, creating film and television productions. Sean, jo Sean joined Wold Communications in LA and helped form Wold International, uh, where he continued to work on the vendor solution side of the media delivery transmission industry in California after ma managing the JISO network pool for Japan and the A-Star network for TV Asahi. Uh, Sean, Sean then joined uh, Teleglobe in Canada to build their broadcast delivery business and was one of the pioneers integrating television services uh, with fiber optic networks to create seamless transport for U.S. and Japanese broadcasters from Canadian gateways to major cities around the world. Uh, he helped build the first MPEG-2 broadcast fiber delivery network via submarine cable and fiber networks while a teleglobe serving multiple global networks. Um, more stuff. Uh, Sean has always had a keen interest in new technologies and finding ways to use them to serve the broadcast community. Um, okay, now I have to go to this other page. Ah, okay. Slides did this. We did that. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is a bit of a round table so that uh, I have a bunch of questions that I was asked. Uh, th this is really quite a, a, an eclectic and I think well, uh, uh, an experience, a set of experienced people in the industry who've been through lots of different changes and, uh, and now they're, they're looking at a whole different way of doing things with the, uh, the internet cloud and content in the cloud and how do you manage that from your different business perspectives um, both as an end user or as a, a service provider. Um, I have a series of questions I'd like to ask the panel and then see if, uh, uh, who wants to take it and then maybe everybody will answer it and we'll see, we'll have, see how we go and we also have the opportunity to hear from uh, the audience. Uh, if you have questions, raise your hand uh, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get your question uh, to the panel or either one person or to everyone. Um, the demand for content these days is greater than ever. Uh, how are we going to be able to maintain or even increase quality to a high def level for consumers? Anybody want to take that? Sean, why don't you start? Gee, thanks. You need a microphone. Um. You know, it's, I found that this topic, when Dick proposed it to us, uh, pretty fascinating because most of us in the broadcast media business have always kind of thought of things in terms of physical connectivity. Uh, link budgets, even if it's RF, there's still a physical electronic path that the signal will uh, kind of guarantee with certain assurance uh, it's going to get there the way you want to. And, what you sent in is going to come out the other end uh, with the same quality. Um, and so when you look at what is the title, uh, Content in the Cloud Transforming Business, I think it's going to be a business enabler with similar quality of service if it's done right. But, you know, my company owns the world's largest IP network. Uh, MCI built a global network. It merged with WorldCom and uh, then merged with Verizon. Uh, AT&T got in very late into the internet business. Uh, they certainly have a lot of presence and of course there's the other large PTT networks around the globe. But um, we are the public backbone uh, at my company. We own UUNet, which you know, set the stage for the rest of internet delivery, especially public internet. What we're looking at for cloud services is what we call private IP, which is almost like a virtual private line service, if you look at it that way. But layer three, and uh, I don't know if people know stacks, but we won't get into a lot of that. But that don't think of storage, for instance, as a physical asset anymore. 
that it's storage in the cloud can and we own CyberTrust, which is, gives you security in the cloud so that you have your copyright protections, your transaction protections, as well as the uh, you know, quality of service that can be enabled over the um, capabilities within layer three. Uh, I can get into that a little bit later, but that kind of sets the groundwork for how you can look at the cloud as not being this amorphous mass, but a collection of very reliable uh, tools uh, to enable quality of uh, your content delivery. Okay, um, Brian, or uh, you want to take, take it? A shot. Um, I, I have a little different spin on it, um, and that uh, you know, I guess the, the question was how to maintain or increase quality as we head toward you know a higher definition product on the cloud and. Just from where I sit, you know, the, at the beginning of this, you uh, content really never gets better from the time it ingests into a network to the time it heads down the distribution chain. Uh, and I, it, in my personal experience, I had uh, just something that happened to me last week, and it's interesting. I'm sitting next to Fox because uh, uh, I'm an avid watcher of 24, and uh, I had uh, dinner out last night. It happens a lot, so I watch 24 on Hulu, and I've been watching that service for about eight months now on Hulu. And uh, just in the past few months, my service uh, my service provider, a large ISP cable operator, has um, throttled down my the bits to my home from uh, a 310 service to a one and a half meg and a lot less than 10. And uh, I think it's, it's very much related to the fact that as the quality's increased and the bits have increased, uh, the last mile providers are having serious choke points. So the idea of how do we get to HD, um, what I think is somewhat ahead of the curve, because I'm seeing SD drop to a jittery, herky-jerky type of experience, where, and it's chasing me back to my television. So I'm not sure the cloud is ready for what it's going through right now. Anybody? Yeah, sure. Hi, Interesting point. For, okay, Sorry. we'll go in, in, in order. Save it. Yeah, just Save to... Uh, you know, Ripple on Keys and Shun. Um, what we do actually is, you mentioned video quality in URL, and so what we're trying to do is actually compress or transcode the video better, and try to crutch the bits and keep the resolution as high as possible. So we're not a customer of Hulu's or anything yet, but maybe we can help on this topic. And what's interesting, what we do today is uh, we bring uh, the expertise around a codec called H.264, which is happened to be uh, adopted by Flash, Microsoft, and also is the de facto standard for HDTV. And um, you know, we, th we, we see the cloud as being a great opportunity and an example of how this uh, unified universal codec can address multiple screen, maximize revenue, and address the 310 kilobits that you, you have, uh, unfortunately. That's an, an ethical way to lower the bandwidth. But um, so we're, we're hoping to help uh, you know, content provider and pipe owners into uh, increasing capacity, reducing their transmission cost, and you guys to raise up the bar on video quality. That's what we do. Cammy. We, we, at, <coughs> excuse me, we at Wagner are taking an approach um, based on what Brian was saying, um, where we're, we're uh, very interested in file-based broadcasting, so the ability to, to get the, the video files as close to the end viewer as possible allows the quality of the video to really be increased. Um, because at that point you can you can send the video down at a much slower rate and, and adapt you know more easily to the to the kinds of concerns that Brian was facing um, by by putting that video content all the way into the home then it can be a higher quality and um, and so so file based broadcasting is really a way to to address some of those those concerns Thank you. Peter. Um, I think that fits very well with our kind of view on this at the moment in that um, I guess we see at the moment satellite as being a very good way of getting high, con high quality content to a lot of people and, um, and then file based content for um, video on demand and that type, of, um, that type of experience and I think that one of the things I think Globecast can 
offer to people to try and help with that is the management such that content can be ingested once, managed, delivered via file, via satellite, or whatever is relevant to, to the end user, and try and make sure the technology is relatively seamless for the broadcaster, um, which I think quite often becomes quite baffled by the, the sheer flexibility and number of options available to everybody at the moment. Okay, yeah, I, wanted I, to I was just going to chime in and just, you know, we well, have... Since we have he a, mentioned Fox in yeah, 24, well, I thought yeah. you'd want to <laughs> say something from your And I'm guilty of end. watching on Hulu myself, so... Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we're in a unique situation because we're dealing with both data and video, and I have a saying that I like to uh, repeat to some of my vendors, and that is, uh, video doesn't queue, which means that, uh, you know, we need to get video out and, and broadcast um, it's not caching, it's not streaming. Um, you take a show like American Idol, um, talk about HD in the living room. Um, you know, there's 30 something million homes uh, watching that show at any one point. I think the best, and maybe Sean can talk more to it, but uh, the best type of quality content any local provider can, can do is probably no more than a million eyeballs at a sec at, at any particular uh, moment right now and that's that's an obstacle that we're faced with getting content at a high level high bit rate to the home so they can actually experience a streaming HD event in their own home and unfortunately we're not there yet you know there's video there's data and these guys know more about uh, the IP cloud than I do but certainly we're, we have a lot uh, further way to go Good. I'm glad there's a broadcaster on the panel. Um, let's uh, let's go on. Another question that came up. Uh, uh, some of these may sound a little bit similar, but uh, w the question was asked: um, uh, What should we what should be expected from service and technology providers um, uh, in relation to the cloud? I mean, the, this has become a whole kind of a new thing. It's up and coming. Uh, and what should we ask the, uh, you know, depending on where you sit up here, uh, what do you want? What do you want the uh, equipment folks or uh, the, the the people you're going to for service uh, within the cloud or on the cloud or through the cloud? What do you want them to uh, deliver to you? And and what are your expectations? Anybody? I can jump in on that again okay. because uh, honestly, something just uh, this week was announced. I don't know if. Uh, all of you have seen it, but we recently um, paired up with Level 3 and with Fox News, uh, basically have come up with a multi-point news service fiber network that we're calling it, which is the Fox News Fiber Network. Um, we went to uh, our vendor and asked them to come up with some architecture that would deliver and share point to multi-point news gathering and distribution over a large network to have one particular news bureau, whether they be in Los Angeles or San Francisco, to uh, share their, their video uh, news gathering to all the other news bureaus, um, some Fox affiliates across the country. So I think a lot of, to, to the question, a lot of it has to do with um, some of us driving it also with the requirements. I, I don't necessarily know if we can expect and sit back for, to wait for the provider to come to us and say this is what we can offer. I think that they're willing to customize and configure some of the things for us based on our needs. Okay, good. Uh, and and you're happy about that and you're taking a lead on that, correct? Uh, it's the first of its kind. Um, you know, it uh, unfortunately for satellite, it's um, you know it's very expensive booking transponders for ENG and. Um, you know, time is of the essence when it's a, a breaking news story. Um, but with the ability of just a, a small web GUI uh, interface, these guys can sit at their desktops and click, feed out content, and send it out across the country within literally seconds. And that's something that the IP cloud is providing for us right now. Okay, Brian, I, I'm guessing you want to say something about that. Well, I, in terms of the, that application, I'm not that familiar with it, but uh, 
you know, one of the things that really comes to mind as we're talking through the quality issue is there really is uh, a role for satellite in the in the cloud, and in particular, as you look at uh, you know performance over you know large file performance over the IP cloud, uh, satellite does point to multi-point distribution better than anybody. So we've got tremendous advantage there, and uh, there are uh, tremendous cost advantages as you scale to multiple locations, because one of the challenges here is you probably don't have that many locations, but as you expand beyond just a wholesale internal product, that gets quite expensive. So there absolutely is still a role for point to multi-point as uh, it, you know, the applications evolve and opportunities evolve, the way I see it. Anybody? Yeah. Here, go ahead, Peter. Yeah. Hi, I think um, one of the things which Globecast have been, if you like, developing very actively over the past few years are management tools to allow that kind of news gathering and uh, make it as seamless as possible and make it such that the actual people who have to do this, i.e. the journalists in the field, the editors back in the studio can use and understand because I think quite often, the, especially for the journalists in the field, if they're going to try and use any kind of IP link, um, they've got a challenge, they've got, they've got to get on the internet somehow, they've got to then um, look after the security and so on and so on. It can become very difficult to do in-house and I think one of the things Glowcast can offer with our content exchange product is really very easy to use and familiar, um, if you like, GUI for the end user to, to use and, uh, and get content back without a lot of the challenges that, um, that people might associate with, with, that, with using FTP or something more difficult. Okay, and Sean and what, Cammy, you wanted to talk to that too? Yeah. Um, Sean and then Cammy. Even though uh, my company is a major fiber provider and an MPLS network provider, I have to agree with Brian. Um, I, my roots are in satellite, and actually the Internet is not designed, and MPLS uh, multicasting is not designed, and I'm talking about the people that invented it, uh, didn't anticipate multicasting as being a function uh, that could broadcast to many. You have to assign where your originating multicast broadcast is coming from over the internet, and you have to assign destinations. And you know the list can't be that long, or it's going to be so expensive. Uh, and you don't have that quality of service assurance because you're throttled on that first and last mile. Uh, whether it's the home consumer and what kind of bandwidth they have. Uh, the bandwidth is going up to the consumer, but for business, um, you know, there, I think there will always be a hybrid model. You want disaster recovery. You want capabilities of having a lot of alternatives. Um, and so it is still an, an evolving uh, strategy on how to execute. Okay, Cammy. Yeah, actually, um, Sean, Sean was kind of going the direction I wanted to go, which is the whole idea of hybrid. And, um, you know, the, both satellite and IP delivery have, have very different advantages. Brian's already talked about on the satellite side the advantages of, of the point to multi point. Um, but on the IP side, the point to point connections have a lot of value and the ability to localize each individual user's uh, you know, viewing experience. So the ability to kind of combine those two architectures into one and really to, to control those from, from one you know, easy to use interface where you can, you can uh, set individual sites as either being able to receive their content from one place or the other or both. Um, al allows the operators a whole new level of of, uh, of functionality that they didn't have before. Um, but but the key to that being workable for for operators is having that easy to use and having the control systems really take care of a lot of the complexities that go on behind the scenes in order to make that happen. And, and the cloud is is making that more acceptable or making it you more user friendly for those people who want to use it? Or is there something else, that, is it IP that's making that more of a, an easier goal? I, I guess the, the original question was kind of what, what uh, service providers and technology companies could do right. in order to, to serve the, the needs of, of using the cloud. And, and to me, creating that easy to use interface 
particularly using both channels within within the cloud and, and taking advantage as, taking advantage of the the benefits of each side is is the key. Okay, well, uh, and uh, let's 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 uh, uh, another question came up is um, um, uh, what are some of the uh, advantages or disadvantages of using uh, satellite for uh, uh, for for IP video uh, for this uh, kind of delivery? Again, I guess that had Brian's name on it. Uh, yeah, I, I think I touched on that a little bit, and that uh, yep. that that you know, in point to multi point, uh, satellite has tremendous advantage. Uh, it, it, you know, clearly as a, as IP applications scale, and I learned just after I spoke a second ago, Fox has thirty five locations. As you start scaling to larger numbers, where that gets to be, you know, uh, 50 or 100, then you know you really see a, a cost curve that, that grows linearly. And with satellite, you you effectively get all those extra locations free. So that's one of the big advantages that we offer. Uh, second, it's QoS. You know, quality of service is still critical to our clients, and satellite offers uh, five nines uh, reliability regularly, and and that's what we have on our fleet, and it's very common throughout the industry. On fiber, it's tough to get that. So you, you find many times three nines kind of five. So it's the difference between you know five minutes outage and five hours outage. So um, customers really depend on those kinds of things and um, there's still huge benefits the satellite brings to the party. Uh, I think there's a lot we can do here. Okay, um, anybody else? No, all right, another question. Um, how can we uh, clarify uh, the IP peering uh, relationships between providers, um, and describe a f and can we describe a few of the uh, positive or even negative applications uh, these uh, ultimately generate for uh, the the end user customer, the home user? Yes, Sean. I thought you'd want to say something. But being one of the companies that everybody wants to peer with, I'll take you back to a previous life when I was at Teleglobe. And, you know, we were a tier one peering provider. Uh, actually, with CNN, we went and did trace routes, and we found that a lot of other companies that told CNN they were delivering their signal, when you actually looked at the ASN assignment on that trace route, it was going over the Teleglobe backbone over our Intelsat connection to the end PTT. But somebody else was selling it at a much higher margin. Uh, there are other companies that they like to call them tier two, tier three providers that have peering agreements with the France Telecoms, British Telecoms, and larger telcos in the world. Um, peering is kind of a misnomer. It's a cross-connect for a wholesale connectivity and bandwidth throughput. Uh, when you really get to the cloud, and that's layer three and above services, uh, I don't consider to be peering to be an enabler. In fact, I think it's kind of a, a predatory uh, way that people kind of tunnel through at someone else's expense, if I can be so blunt. Um, and because it isn't an enabling process. What it does is it allows you to connect and mirror to other um, networks, but um, what I see a, a real growth in is actual true CDN delivery, uh, if uh, you can take it up a stack, um, where we've just announced on our FIO side of the house, uh, it's a, you can look it up on Content and Opal website, but we, we uh, made an announcement with Velocix, uh, which is the former Cash Logic, uh, and it's a CDN enabler uh, that you have acceleration and QoS all wrapped into, um, you know, the media delivery. Uh, this is specifically for some applications over our our FiOS ISP offering, but it's something very similar to what the limelights and the Akamai's are doing when Akamai bought Speed Era, and I'm just talking as an industry veteran in that space. I worked for a streaming media company. That peering 
uh, I, I really think is a word that doesn't get you anywhere today. Okay. Anybody want to add? Don't have to. Um, did you, Keith, were you about to talk? Uh, well, the only, you know, I, I, you know, once again, I'm coming to the table as mostly an end user and uh, my, my, and that's good. My educational process and learning about peering and, and, uh, the multiple IP clouds is, is fairly limited, but, um, you know, I was surprised to learn mostly that these peering agreements take place and, uh, they're typically on some rolling three day cancellation, uh, contract or, or something like that from what I understand but um, no the intent was really to get an understanding of how some of these uh, end users hang off the edge of the cloud versus uh, who are dedicated on the cloud and the agreements that take place between uh, the groups while I can't speak to knowing all the uh, minutia about it I just knew that there were these agreements um, and uh, maybe you're right maybe it is a uh, a dangerous term to use these days so okay um, two questions first of all is there a significant or special IP solution that can be supported by and for the cloud and um, uh, what are some of the tools um, that can be implemented uh, or employed to help further secure video IP uh, over uh, uh, video, uh, sorry, se to, to secure video over uh, an IP uh, solution. Go to question number four. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I, I think that there, you know, just listening to this conversation kind of makes me think that there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, you know, just talking about peering, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that. You've got really big guys and really small guys now with the, 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 the cable operators controlling phone traffic and large video. Um, the littler ISPs I know of um, are actually having to buy fiber to go around their neighbor uh, because they're just, it's so asymmetric in terms of their Hulu and YouTube traffic. Um, it's just cheaper for them to buy fiber to YouTube. So you got a whole sort of uneven internet world growing that's being fed by video. I, I believe that there's a bigger play here for the industry and, and, and I, I, I'd call it almost a VDN where the high definition video is just going to choke this to death. So you're going to need new types of CDNs popping up that do more things, that do it with high definition and do it at a level, a QoS level that hasn't been done yet. Because you know, thing, you're seeing this arc of quality coming in as more video choices are available. So I, I think there really is something here. Um, I don't think it's on the market today, but I, I really do see something coming. Okay. Anybody? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Sylvain. Just to add on uh, what, what uh, was just said here is that, in fact, that one of the tools uh, that is coming up in terms of compression of video is getting to a point where you can transfer an HD or Blu-ray movie over the cloud and pretty much faster than real time. So, you know, our company is in France, which is a crazy country for, you know, we get like, I, I get 30 megabits downstream at home, right? Uh, and what you do with this uh, over for a telco player, uh, it, it's a telco player, is, um, uh, is sending HD data and, and of course telephony, which is a triple play of a telco. And what's interesting is that, uh, you know, we've deployed over there with an operator called Free Telecom, and the HD that we compress is roughly around six megabits. So that means literally, I have 20 megabits to play with, and um, telephony is okay, data goes there. So uh, when you apply this type of bandwidth to a higher, uh, higher quality for transmission over satellite, sorry you get to send maybe two or three HD over the existing transponder. Then now when uh, you're doing uh, news gathering um, because you need your journalist to send stuff maybe over an iPhone, that's under one megabit. And all this, um, and I said it earlier, is, is, is something that H.264, which is a new codec, is enabling. So I think listening to all the audience here, we're, we're the middleman, we're listening to the pipe constraints 
which is what Globcast is doing, the file to file that you mentioned, and also making sure those guys are happy about their content video quality. So, but at the end of the day, the cloud is all of us here surrounded. I don't think there's any competition. It's actually growing to such a point where satellite, it becomes a cloud as well, and there's gonna be an hybrid play, like you guys said. It's a very interesting time, and more money for monetizing content on iPhone all the way to, to HD or even Ultra HD, which is another stuff coming out. Okay, I saw a lot of head people going, yeah, yeah. Well, anybody good. anybody want to jump in or? Uh, we're not sending it over the iPhone, but, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's going to get there one way or the other. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. Well, 24, right. But for news gathering, we're, you know, I, all I was going to indicate was more to the topic of the, the question was about security and uh, public Internet, obviously, is a concern. We, we tend to stick with the MPLS layer over the public internet so um, at that point we're, we're providing some security or receiving some security uh, but we look for that obviously whether it's a, a feed going to MySpace or you know NFL being backhauled to the, to the network um, from a venue uh, I need to make sure that the content um, and the proprietary rights are withheld and, and secure at all times really okay yeah go ahead Peter I think the, um, from a news gathering perspective and contribution of file perspective, the um, security question is quite interesting because, again, from our discussion with a lot of companies in this field who want to contribute news or whatever, um, they're actually a lot more, con their primary concern is getting it in fast and everything else is kind of secondary to that. And any kind of solutions which are put in place almost have to never slow down the, the flow of that content in so you know, it's not acceptable for a news gatherer to sit there and spend 20 minutes encrypting a file then then send it in via FTP or whatever and I think that um, some of the technologies we've been working on have been very much aimed at saying well okay let's provide that security with no overhead so maybe look at the transport level and so on um, and then try and do that in a way which for the news gathering and companies is really straightforward and easy to manage and almost impossible for them to ever get wrong as such. Um, well, I, I mean, we've been over, all over the lot with yep. content and the kinds of content. Uh, and you mentioned news and news gathering. Um, uh, when you say fast, that's obvious that that's a biggie. I, I know it is for me. I know it is for uh, for Keith and his company uh, and others who were in the, the news, uh, getting the news in and then getting it on air, especially the 24-7 networks, uh, it's, a, it's a biggie. And almost everything else takes second place to uh, how quickly can you actually get this back from wherever the event is to, um, to the consumer, the, uh, out on air to your customer, to your clients. And um, uh, uh, do you see the technologies coming along at this point? Do you see um, uh, in, in all of these different areas, one in making the content more and more easily available, uh, in making the news gathering aspect of it uh, in, with lower bandwidth, with better quality, uh, with less latency, with greater speed. Do, do you see these things developing? Are you finding things at the show of interest? Should I go look at something? Should I not tell Keith about it? Um, uh, is anybody, <laughs> are, there, are there things that are going on uh, that you want to bring up? Anybody want to mention anything that they've seen in, in the last day or so? Yes, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd like to hear Wagner's perspective on it because I actually see some of the uh, FTP uh, technologies really being a lot of the long-term solution. Um, you know, there but is not for, that's not for live. That's not for live yes, news. I understand. I, I qualify that at the outset. Okay. I, I was speaking with Brian earlier. Um, you know, there is the real time, real now. The video is. I won't use vulgarity. So it's not what we are all used to doing for most of our <laughs> careers. But it's on the air. It's live and it's synchronous. But. How do you make sure for retransmission or repurposing of that content that there is another way to get it to the server, to redistribute, to replay it later, and have enough bits there 
to have it any kind of retransmission quality. I mean, I remember the days with MPEG-2 where we wanted it 422, and now it was just, as long as it's MPEG-2, I don't care what flavor it is. Um, at, at a certain yeah, point... But, but, but why is that? I mean, that's really more of an efficiency issue because 422 is going to take a little bit more bandwidth even though you're getting better quality. Yeah, than well, there's more no? information frames and therefore more chroma, but, but you know, the H.264, I participated in a lot of the early developments of that and actually, you know, Windows Media 9 and then Optimize actually was compliant with that and that was then a, a web enabler but it isn't necessarily something that's archived for mastering or retransmission the way the MPEG-2 standards were. And so you really have two objectives. One, to get on the air live to your consumer, to your customer, and then another to have a broadcast quality maybe be integrated into a documentary later. And you have to fulfill both functions or where is your you know, evergreen revenue? Okay, yes, go ahead. Sylvain? Oh, I have two mics. You don't need two okay. mics. Just. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. This is why there's a term of transcoding that keeps on coming everywhere. So transcoding gives you the flexibility to go from MPEG-2 to H.264 back and forth. And for archiving, this is the big question mark, right? We, we, we started an office in Hollywood. It's kind of cool to go there. You meet studios and... You know, the famous mezzanine format is going all over the place. So you have Avid uh, pushing their standard, Apple with the ProRes, and then MPEG-2 is easier to stay because it's convenient and open. Um, it doesn't matter. I think eventually H.264 will stay because it's a multi-screen, multi-resolution, and the IS bandwidth efficiency. MPEG-2 is easier to stay because that's what your customer will consume. And in between, you know, as a vendor, we need to find ways to transcode and, and go fast at it and push content out very fast. And so, you know, our job is to keep quality very high and make sure that you don't have to worry about the codec that gets out there to your customers. And this guy here will try to reduce the cost because the bandwidth is going down and he try to cram more channel on a satellite. So I think it's a bright future coming out. And, and uh, this show, I've seen a lot of exciting investment on compression. Not us, but just in general. Uh, people claim that MPEG-2 is doing better. You know, 30% improvement. That's a huge news for not changing your setup box out there. Um, so it's looking, uh, but transcoding, my point was just transcoding is out there to solve those issues and just uh, ripple on, on your point. Okay. Um, well, kind of in light, in line with all of this, um, y you've got two different kinds of developments taking place. One regarding the technology, and the the other uh, regarding the kinds of services that are being provided. So uh, the question is, um, which is most important? Is the provision of service more important, or is the development of the technology more important? Or is it really, you know, the answer is yes, both, you know, shut up, Dick. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, yeah, so shut let, up, Dick. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's hear what tempted. you have to say. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, I guess the, the question was, is, is service provision more important than technology? Right, or vice versa. Uh, I, I would, my perspective is that uh, they're both important, but if you had to pick one, service provision would come first. Uh, okay. Just we deal with you know last mile service providers constantly, and they don't have the luxury of of picking technology that may or may not work. They have to deliver a product at a quality to their customer, so it's got to be there. So I think you almost work your way back from the customer experience. So that's why I'd say service provisions job one. Uh, if you look at a company like FiOS that's out there, uh, they chose MPEG two technology even though MPEG four had been invented. And I thought that was a good decision for them because they chose something that was tried and true, it worked, they got a product out there that was considered state of the art even though they chose old technology. So to me that kind of proved the, the, the paradigm that they were able to use MPEG-4 in their VOD but um, that, that was a good choice. So I, I, having watched that, I, I, I service provision for me. Okay, good answer. A anybody else want to speak to that? Okay, go ahead, Peter. Thank you. 
Um, I guess from our perspective there is a kind of media services provider. Um, we definitely would say service is, is, is critical and um, within that really the future proofing of, of what broadcasters are doing is critical. Um, so for example making sure that we're storing and managing content in formats that in five, five years time will still be um, usable or repurposable for something else. Um, and I think that really it's up to um, the service providers in general to, to help the broadcasters you know, focus on the content and almost have the technology problems taken away from them a little bit such that they can spend their time trying to connect with their audience and, uh, and leave the service, leave the technology um, and the kind of future proofing of that just, just to get on in the background really. Okay, anybody else on this one? Yeah, Cammie, go ahead. I, I guess my view is more a little bit of both in that the, the technologies should really be an enabler to, to create new services and, and allow those services to grow um, and, and develop in different ways in that uh, you know maybe the, the current set of services aren't able to provide just because there's not a technology there to support it. So to me, it's kind of a hand-in-hand -hand thing. Okay, in other words, one, one, one hand washes the other and... Uh, they really are codependent. Okay, uh, is there anybody who's just who's the real technologist here who just want to say no? Technology is more important. Okay, well then it's it's either a combo or it's uh, the service provisioning is the most important. So that's uh, okay. That's a good answer for the audience. Um, uh, we've got about ten minutes left. L let me see if there's anybody. I got enough questions to fill it, but let me see. Does anybody in the audience? Uh, have a question they'd like to ask one or more members of this panel? Don't be shy. Yes, and stay, say, uh, wait a second, someone's going to give you a mic. Tell us uh, your name and where you're from uh, or what company you're with and then ask your question and to who or whomever. Ranjit with Digital Stream. You've been using it's not You actually have to turn the mic on. Is, is that working? There actually should be a green light, I think. Try it out. Is it working? Yes, now yeah. it is. Thank you. Ranjit Prakasam with Digital Stream. <laughs> We've been using Flash and MPEG 4, and it's a total software application. It doesn't work, Flash and MPEG 4. Why don't you stand up and use this? Yeah, just stand up and we'll, yeah. we'll share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ra yeah. Ranjit Better. with Digital Stream. We've been using Flash encoding MPEG-4, and it's an entire software application, and now we're doing live streaming of news. Okay. Oh, Does somebody want to talk about Flash and MPEG-4? That's funny, because uh, that Thank was you. actually one of the subjects I was going to speak about, and I actually have some data here. Uh, I attended... Uh, an Adobe open screen project uh, session yesterday. And uh, they reported that, for, this is Adobe's data, uh, but that 40% of what bandwidth providers uh, do today involves video. That three of the top 10 websites uh, have over 100 million video starts a month. And um, then there are other ones that are growing. But Adobe has started a, a new project called an open screen project that you can go to on the public web. But you know, the Macromedia Flash Player uh, has been clearly adopted as the enabler. And that's, there's a difference between what we've been talking about, which is more in the professional industrial market versus the consumer market and the enablers that um, the uh, end user has and then also the engines in which the uh, video program provider uses for instance uh, the Disney company is very public about the fact they use move networks to get their video images out there and it's a combination of all of these elements uh, so you know any given manufacturer's got or a service provider model has a slightly different flavor of how they enable it, 
But it's all got to be standards-based, meet specifications, and to be able to be compliant with the network protocols that are used uh, to get it there. And it's a lot of tweaking. That's why a service provider model has to be somewhere in the play. I just, the only comment I'd make is that there really still are a lot of players out there. Uh, Flash is clearly one of the ones that are being adopted as almost a de facto standard, but uh, if you're a content provider, you have, and I'd be interested to know what you, how you feel about this, but it, it, it seems as if there's going to be a need for a, almost a mezzanine re-encode in a multiple player level in this business for some time to come. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? No. Uh, you know, look, move, move Networks is something that we're familiar with, obviously. We're, we're using it in MySpace and um, other entities. But for the most part, I, I'm not as familiar with the encode side of things and the CDN side as th of things as, as much as I am on the broadcast side. But, um, you know, there is an adoption that's taking place. There is a convergence going on. Yeah, uh, it, uh, we need to adopt, I think, multiple formats and make sure that ultimately to the end user, it's seamless. That's all we're all looking for. We want to turn on the TV and watch our show, go to the internet, make sure we have Hulu and 24 streaming at a good rate so it all looks good whether I'm on TV or I'm on my computer. Okay, and you don't care whether it's fiber or satellite or... Uh, two string and two tin cans it's got to work and work all the time ultimately that's what I'm looking for yeah you okay. know I'm not a provider I want it to be provided for me but I don't want to get a complaint yeah. from my users whether they're turning on their TV or you know okay and I mean like us I know we always also want a good escalation uh, uh, level when whoever we're dealing with so we actually know who to yell at and in what order when, when something goes wrong. <laughs> so that, that's good. Any other uh, audience questions, anybody? Okay, well, we've got about time for like one more question here. Let's see, what's, what's a good one? Um, well, I, I guess uh, maybe I'll come back to Keith to, to ask a question here. Um, you, 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 don't, you were saying you really don't care which, uh, what the delivery system is. is um, does, uh, do, do you see advantages of one system over another uh, when it comes to getting delivery uh, or out to your customers or uh, satellite over fiber, fiber over satellite? Let's take for uh, an example. We, we were working with... Um, a couple of different companies to, to handle the presidential debates. It was, um, it was multifaceted in the sense that uh, we had Fox News, we had the network, we had MySpace, all trying to take content from a single point. You know, when, when you're dealing with end-to-end, um, -end, point to point, our first, um, our first reaction is to go with fiber only because, and it's no knock to satellite, um, we use satellite on the broadcast network. I mean, we're going from point to 220 Fox affiliates, so that's, that makes sense. Um, typically, no, but for, for the presidential debate, you know, we're, we're encoding with MPEG-4 on site, we're delivering it back to, to our uh, Fox DC bureau, who's then using some production switching going on, delivering it to Fox News, who's then encoding it again, delivering it cross-country. I mean, you know. I have a headache. Right, okay. exactly. My point being that um, typically, yes, I, I want high-quality video. I want it to be provided to me in a seamless manner, just like as an end user or home user. I, I don't want to see a difference. But, yes, ultimately in my professional cur my my role, I want to make sure that I can depend on my vendors, whether I go with fiber or satellite, to deliver everything that um, ultimately is going to be clean and, and pristine and meet my overall satisfaction. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody have w any last minute thing they want to throw out here to the audience before we wrap? Because we, we're out of time. So it's got to be quick, whatever it is. Anyone? Okay, well, let, let, me, let me just thank our panel. These, this has been a very interesting group to have here. Uh, please, everybody, let's give an applause to Peter, Cammie, 
uh, Sylvain, uh, Brian, uh, Keith, and Sean. Thank you all for taking your time today to do this uh, and for taking part in the panel. Don't all leave yet. Sit down. Wait. I'm not done. Um, having thanked everybody, I also want to uh, once again um, uh, thank, uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to thank the uh, sponsors again. That's Inlsat, Inmarsat, Embredo Systems, and Cisco. And I want to invite you all to uh, continue to take part and, uh, and, and uh, sit in on these uh, presentations. The, the next panel session is going to be uh, um, digital news gathering, look ma, no satellite. Um, I don't know quite how they're going to do that, but um, uh, that should be an interesting panel. It starts here in about 10 minutes. You're welcome to sit in on that one as well. Uh, thank you all again, and uh, we hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation from SSPI and WTA. Have a good morning and a good show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hey.